Dr. Tom met Randy Clark in 1999, the founder of Global Awakening, and began traveling with and for Randy the following year, bringing his church members along to encounter the supernatural with them. In 2003, while traveling with Global Awakening, Tom had an encounter with the Holy Spirit that changed the course of his life forever. Bringing over 40 years of ministry experience as an educator, church planter, and pastor, Tom is now the executive director and overseer of the Apostolic Network ANGA and international speaker. Traveling over three-fourths of the year, Tom Jones carries a healing anointing, a passion for revival, and the Father's love. Tom and his wife Brenda have been married for 43 years and have two children, Christina Kyle and Brian. Christina is married to Clay Kyle. They have two children, David and Kami. Tom and Brenda currently live in Cleveland, Tennessee. Please make welcome the Executive Director, Overseer of the Apostolic Network, Dr. Tom Jones. Hello, everyone. I want to say welcome to all of our Nigerian uh, friends. As you know, we were unable to come and be with you live this year. So we're doing a video event. Um, now, we've been doing these at Global Awakening for uh, a number of weeks now and found out they've been very successful and very fruitful. And we've seen, uh, actually seen hundreds of people healed just through uh, watching the videos. So I thank you for joining with us. Thank you for allowing us to visit with you. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is being shown in a number of different venues um, across maybe Lagos and Abuja. I actually am not sure which cities uh, we're hosting the, the, you know, smaller live events with the video, but we do bless you guys. We're thinking about you. We pray for you. Uh, now, some of you may have noticed that I have a little bit of a different look, but since we were sheltered in place, quarantined away, I decided to shave my head. And so I do have a little bit of a different look but my name is uh, Dr. Tom Jones, and I'm thrilled to be with you today. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about a, what I think is a, a subject that really needs to be addressed in the season in which we're in. I wanted to talk about really the, the idea of living at peace, and we will be looking at a number of scriptures. I want to talk about living at peace during times of pressure. But before I begin the teaching and we start looking at the scriptures today, I want to take just a moment and pray for you and bless you. So, Father, we're just so thankful for you. I lift every one of our friends up. I ask that you just comfort them. I speak peace. I speak life. I just speak health over every person that's in the room today. Lord, there's no difficulty or no challenge that we're unable to overcome as long as we walk hand in hand with you. Lord, your presence is near. All we have to do is reach out and grab hold of it. So Lord, I bless every person. Lord, let your faith just flow throughout the building today. And I pray for peace in troubling times, Lord. Teach us to walk on the water and not to let the waves, the troubling waves of difficulty overwhelm us and cause us to take our eyes off of you. So Lord, we honor and exalt you and magnify your name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. As I mentioned a little earlier, I think this subject is very appropriate living with uh, peace in, the, in, a, in, a, in a very troubling time. And I, I just want to begin by asking the question, how many of you are facing pressures right now? Facing the pressures of, of maybe staying at home. I don't know how 
your government is treating COVID-19, but here we're facing the pressure of being at home. I usually travel about 240 days a year. I haven't traveled, I don't think, since March. I don't think I've been out of the country since February. And uh, doesn't look like I'll be doing any traveling until August. So I'm not even able to go into the office. And so uh, I know there's the pressure of maybe being sheltered away and there's the pressures of, of watching out for your health maybe the pressure of caring for a loved one who is sick, the pressure of finances. I know many are in America struggling, and I'm sure with, with Nigeria as well, struggling with the difficulties of making a living of, of a country that we're very close to. The country of Brazil is really struggling right now with death and with uh, disaster as far as uh, being able to cope with their finances and the question might be on your mind, how do we walk in peace in times like this? Now, I don't know that I have a simple answer. And I know that it's, it's a process. But I believe that we have a Jesus that does want us to walk in peace. He doesn't want us to live under the pressure cooker. He doesn't want us to, to bury things until we explode. So we may need to share our, our burdens with one another. Maybe share with each other so you can receive, receive prayer. But we're not the only ones that have faced pressure. I have a couple of scriptures. Uh, maybe let me read them to you without you turning to these. One is in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, if you do want to write it down or if you want to turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 20, 28. The Apostle Paul writes, besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Now, the word pressure that's used there means a state of prolonged concern and anxiety. He faced daily the pressure of his concerns. He was feeling uh, pressure from, from just the anxiety over the other churches and what they were facing. You may be facing that kind of pressure as you think about your loved ones and your family and your friends. But then in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, he uses another word for pressure. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, the apostle writes, so that we despaired even of life. That verse expresses the depth of Paul's pressure. And it is a different word. It means an extreme burden. They run to this burden of, of uh, that he said, far beyond their ability to endure because they suffered great hardships in the province of Asia. And if you, if you do any reading about their struggles there in Asia, you'll realize that it was a difficult time for them just like we're facing difficult time. Now, while we may not be able to avoid the pressures of life, I think there's some tips or some keys to managing that pressure. And I want to share some of, the, some of those with you today. But let's talk about a little bit about understanding pressure. Uh, because, well, let me, let me just give you a definition, one that I wrote down. It, it can be defined as the burden of physical or mental distress. It's oppression, stress, the urgency of matters demanding attention, whether it's physical matters or financial matters. It's that, that urgency to see those things solved. And let me just say that pressure affects everyone. No one is exempt from all pressure. Uh, our pressures are different. Maybe the pressures that I'm facing today are different than the pressures that you're facing. Maybe the pressures that Finney and Mina are facing right now are different than the pressures that you're facing. But we all have pressures. They're just, they're, they're different pressures, so, such as the pressures of life-changing decisions which need to be made, the pressures of broken relationships, the pressures of inadequate finances, the fresh pressures of ongoing family illnesses, the pressure of family problems, difficulties with children, difficulties with, with our, our spouses, and then the pressures of unhappy work environment. So we all face pressures at one level or another. Now, where does pressure come 
from. And I, I generalize these into two different categories. Hopefully you're following with me. I'm trying to go a little quicker than normal. But there's pressures that come from without. And then there's pressures that come from within. The pressures from without is things like having too much to do, uh, conflicting schedules, demands from other people, sickness, things that come from, out, from without. But then there's pressures that come from within. And sometimes this is the greatest pressure that we face. It's pressure that we put on ourselves, our pressure, pressures to measure up, uh, pressures of competition, uh, pressures of ambition. So it's pressures that we put on ourselves. So they're the pressures that come from outside, and many of those we don't have any control over. But then there are the pressures that come from within, and I, I think there are times that we can, we, can, we can address those. Now, how does pressure affect us? Well, first, it can cause us to lose our joy. It's difficult to live with joy when we're not at peace. And I'm talking about a peace that passes all understanding. I'm not talking about an outward emotion of joy. I'm talking about an inner joy. It's very difficult to, to live with joy when there's stress on us and there's pressure on us. It's very difficult to live with joy when we don't have peace. It can cause you to be impatient with your family. It can cause you to be patient, impatient with others. And I, see, I saw this as a pastor where financial uh, concerns were involved. Financial pressure came into a person's life and they would be impatient. And maybe their spouse or their children didn't realize why uh, their father or their mother was impatient with them. It can cause you to be tied up emotionally in knots. And again, as I said before, can cause you to, be, uh, to lose your peace. It can actually, pressure and stress can cause you to be physically sick. The adrenal system. Uh, my, my daughter is an endocrinologist. She's a medical professional. She's a doctor, a physician, and she deals with the, endo the endocrine system. And so the adrenals as to being under pressure for such a long time can fail and cause us to have adrenal burnout and be very ill. And let me just go on to say that not only did Paul face pressure, the Lord knew pressure. Now, you may not think of him knowing pressure, but he faced pressure. He just didn't give in to pressure. He learned to walk at peace in the midst of his pressure. He faced pressure from his family. I could take you to scriptures where his family misunderstood him, didn't understand his mission. Uh, he had pressure from his friends. I mean, his disciples, they resisted him at every turn. They didn't seem to understand him. I mean, he had, they had to learn lessons that he was trying to teach them over and over and over. And, and we do that as well. So he faced pressure from his family. He faced pressures from friends. He faced pressure, faced pressure from the church leaders. They persecuted, they wanted to kill him. And then the crowds, those who only wanted him to, to do what they wanted him to do, to meet all of their needs. And there were times they almost crushed him from the pressure that they were put on, putting on him. But the Lord understood peace. The Lord knew how to walk in peace in the times of, of, of pressure. And how did he do that? I want you to turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 8. I'll give you a moment to turn there, and we're going to look at a few verses in the latter, uh, the mid part of John chapter 8. How did the Lord live with pressure? And I think this is very important during the time in which we live. First of all, Jesus knew who he was. Verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. He understood his identity. He knew who he was. And regardless of the stress, regardless of the pressure that you're facing right now, an understanding of who you are, it's very, very important. You are a child of God. You are a son of the Most High. And he's there for you. He said he will never leave us or forsake us. COVID-19, in the midst of that, he has not forgotten your needs. He's not forgotten what you face. So we need to understand who we are. Very important that we understand that. So first of all, he knew he was. 
Romans 8, 17. Now, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we almost uh, may also share in his glory. I am a child of the king and my path is ordered by him. So understand who you are. Understand your identity. Secondly, Jesus knew who he was to please. John 8, 29. The one who sent me is with me. He has not me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Jesus knew who he was to please. He was not worried about pleasing the religious leaders. He was not. He was not concerned about pleasing his disciples. He was not even first and foremost concerned about pleasing uh, his family. Let me ask us the question, who are we trying to please? Is it others? Is that who we try to please? Is that how we try to live our lives? I wrote down a paragraph here I want to read to you. Until Christ is securely in charge of our lives, our insecurity will make us vulnerable, hungry for other people's approval. Our need to be loved and accepted and approved will drive us to comply with what other people want us to be and do. Are we trying to please others? Are we trying to please ourselves? Do we live life wanting to please ourselves? Or are we trying to please him? That's one of the ways that Jesus was always able to walk in in peace was First, he understood his identity. And then second, he understood who he was trying to please. He understood the importance of right relationship. He was in right relationship to the Father. And then the third thing is Jesus knew what he was to do. He understood his mission. Now, verses 27 and 28, still in chapter 8, they did not understand that he was telling them about his Father, So Jesus said, when you had lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one I claim to be and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. Jesus understood his mission. In the midst of the virus, in the midst of the difficult times that we're facing, we are to know our identity, we are to know our mission, and we are to know we have to have a right relationship with the Father. That's how Jesus lived in peace. So the main point is if we want to live a life of peace, if we want to address the pressure, then we need to understand how the Lord dealt with pressure and deal with it the same way. There was one other thing that Jesus did that I want to mention to you that's not actually is not found in, in, in uh, chapter 8, but Jesus developed a life of intimacy with the Father. It's implied in these verses, and he lived this life of intimacy. You'll often find that Jesus went away to pray, and this is a great opportunity. It's a great time for us to be able to pray and spend time with the Lord rather than worrying and, and trying to, to, to figure out things that we're unable to understand at this point. It's a great time to fast. It's a great time to pray. It's a great time to worship and be alone with the Lord. And so that he lived this life of relational intimacy. There are some things that hinder our path to intimacy. And let me just mention a few of them. One is substitution. Now, this may not be clear at first, but it's substitution. Sometimes people will substitute Bible study for intimacy. Jesus lived a life of relational intimacy. It's easy to spend time studying the scripture and not be in a relationship of intimacy with the Father. Is Bible study important? The answer is a definite yes, but it shouldn't replace intimacy. Secondly, church attendance. Some people let church attendance replace intimacy. Is church attendance? Yes. 
Yes, definitely yes. But we allow that to replace intimacy. A third one is serving the church. And I love to see people serve in the church. They, they are important. They're very important. But sometimes people will let what they do in the church replace intimacy. All of those are important. Uh, Bible study, uh, serving the church, church attendance. In fact, I, I've known people who knew the scripture very well, but did not have a right, a relational intimacy with the Lord. I've had professors who could read their Bibles from the original language. They understood Greek so well, they could read their Bibles in Greek. But I personally didn't recognize a life of relational intimacy. So if we want to, if we want to handle the pressure in our life, if we want to live a life of peace, then do it in such a way that we live a life of relational intimacy with Him. Another hindrance to intimacy is rest, restlessness. We're so busy going all the time that we never settle down to spend time with him. And then one more is a lack of self-worth. It, we, we don't feel like, in, in fact, in our minds, we don't feel valued enough. We feel something hindering our relationship with the Father. We feel a distance, distance with Him. And we look at ourselves and we think of ourselves as being nothing. That's the reason I say understanding our identity is so important. Understanding who we are. Our mind can be a primary battleground of spiritual warfare. The enemy, we don't face him necessarily face to face in a physical confrontation, but he does work in our mind. And our mind needs to be renewed daily. If you've ever heard Bill Johnson teach about renewing the mind, our mind needs to be renewed because it is a battleground. And then a the last one is a misunderstanding of the nature of God. We evaluate often our relationship with God and um, in light of our relationship with our earthly father. And our earthly father may not have been a good father. He may have been abusive. He may have been physically abusive. He may have been verbally abusive. May not have treated us like a son or accepted us as a son or a daughter. But our father in heaven is a good father. Our God is a good God. Romans 8, 15 through 16 said, For you do not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. You don't have, you do not fear your earthly father, your heavenly father, but you spirit receive the spirit of sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. I feel like even as I'm speaking and teaching right now, there are some folks that need uh, sons and daughters that need healing in the area of their understanding of the nature of God. They don't see him as a, a, a loving father. Because they were abused as sons. They were abused as daughters. Your heavenly father will not abuse you. He is not abusive as a father. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 said, he, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. We've been adopted as sons and daughters. We have a heavenly father that loves us. We have a heavenly father that cares about what we're going through right now. And he is a good father. We are joint heirs with Jesus. We're brothers with Jesus. And he is our heavenly father. God has adopted every one of us as members of his household. Jesus has already paid the Christ. So I want to encourage you to understand the nature of your father. Understand that he's a good God. I'm going to give you one more thought to, um, about pressure. And this is especially true if you're a leader in ministry. And that is, please understand that pressure, if you live with pressure, if you live with discouragement, if you live with pressure all the time, it can eventually lead to discouragement. The pressures of life, the pressures of ministry. 
I want to ask you, if you will, turn to me one with one more passage of Scripture. I don't want to go much longer, but I do want us to look at Numbers chapter 11. And you you may, be, may remember the story of, of uh, Moses with the children of Israel and how they, they grumbled and complained. And uh, I just want to begin with verse 10. Moses heard the people of every family wailing each of the entrance to his tent. The Lord became exceedingly angry, and Moses was troubled. To overcome this kind of pressure that leads to discouragement, be careful of listening to the wrong people. See, Moses became troubled because he listened to the wrong people. He understood. He began to take on himself the pressures of the people. So living under pressure can lead to discouragement if you listen to the wrong people. Now, I'm not saying you don't ever listen to the advice of others around you. Um, there's wisdom in the multitude of counsel. But be careful. You don't listen to what people that I call that have the chronic complainer syndrome. Those who are always chronic complainers. They never see any good in anybody or, or anything. They only see the negatives or hardships in life. Let's look at each, uh, Israel again in verse 1. Now, the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. They were always complaining. They never, they couldn't see the good. They had their own agenda in mind. They had their own, their, the way they wanted to see things go. In verse 4, since the rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. All the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlics, garlics that we garlic that we had. And so they had their own agenda. They had their own personal agenda. They weren't thinking about the future. They weren't thinking about God's agenda. They were thinking about their own agenda. And they had no vision for the future. Let me read it to you again. Remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Only the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic didn't have any vision for the future. All they could think about was today. This virus, COVID-19, is going to come to an end. There's, a, there's still a vision over your life. I, I, I often will teach on uh, living your destiny. God has a vision for every one of you. Everyone, he has a purpose in mind for every one of you. And COVID-19, no disease, no sickness can keep that vision from coming to pass. And they were unappreciative of God's present provision. Verse 6, but now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. God was providing them manna every day, and they were unappreciative of it. Those are the kinds of people you don't want to listen to. So be careful in this season of listening to the wrong people. The second thought I want to give you about how to overcome uh, discouragement when you're facing pressure is to uh, be careful of carrying the whole burden by yourself. And again, leaders, you can't carry this whole burden. Moses did this. And when you try to do, when you try to carry the whole burden by yourself, you end up with an accusing attitude. Let me read to you verse 11, an accusing attitude. Why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? He developed an accusing. He, he was beginning to point a finger at God. I mean, God had been able to deliver them from the household of Pharaoh, deliver them out of Egypt, and now he's pointing a finger at God. You develop a questioning attitude. In verse 12, did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why did you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their forefathers? And he, he begins to question God. And we do this in the midst of pressure. Forgive me for the lawnmower in the background. I can't help the noise. Sorry. So they, they, uh, he developed a questioning attitude, attitude and then a defeatist attitude in verse 15. 
If this is how you're going to treat me, put me to death right now. Moses is saying, God, if this is what you're going to do, put me to death. So be careful of trying to carry the whole burden. Now, God reveals to him later about that he was not alone. And you're not alone in, in the trials that you're facing right around right now. You're not alone in this situation. God is with you. He's there. He, you, you, have, you can walk right now with, the, with Jesus' hand, holding him by the hand, and walk through this season. And the answer is to share your burdens. And that's what he did in verses 16 through 17. I, I want to be careful of taking too long here. But read verses 16 and 17. The answer was to share your burdens with others. And that's what he did. And then number three, uh, thing, third thing I find in this 11th chapter, is be careful of assuming the place of God. That's what Moses was doing. He was trying to solve this problem himself. I, one thing I do know, I'm not God and you're not God. Don't try to assume the place of God. You do what you can do and leave the rest of it up to God. And then the fourth thing about uh, overcoming discouragement when you're facing pressure is be careful of forgetting the ability of God. In verses 21 through 23, and then we're going to close with this. But Moses said, Here I am among 600,000 men on foot, and you say I will give them meat deep for a whole month? Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough of all the fish in the sea were caught for them? The Lord answered Moses, Is the Lord's arm too short? You will now see whether or not what I say will come true to you, for you. And, and the Lord stepped in and provided meat for them to eat, provided quail for them to eat. Don't assume, don't forget the ability of God. I know in the times of trouble, when we're facing difficult times like many of us are right now, it's easy to forget the delivering power of God. What God did in the past, He will do again. He's always been, he's been there for us. I can never, I cannot think of one time in all of my life that God failed me, that He was not there. He's there for you. He is there for me. I want to pray for you today. I know there's a ministry team that's available to minister to you. And I, in just a moment, I'm sure there will be instructions given on what how they're to do and uh, what they're to do and how they're to do it. But I want to pray for you and, and also for physical problems. Ministry team, whatever need they have, um, if it's encouragement, if it's the, the ability to overcome the stresses they're facing, pray for them. If they're, they're, if they're discouraged, pray for them. And then also pray for their physical needs. But let me pray for you right now. Just hold your hands up. Just, just If you're about to receive a gift, hold your hands up like this. Father, I bless my Nigerian brothers and sisters. Fill their hands, Lord, with the resources they need right now to go through this difficult time. Whatever they're facing, whatever they're going through, Lord, I pray. Touch their hearts. Touch their lives, Lord. I give them to you. I give them to you, Lord. Minister health and life to them. Lord, those that are feeling weighted, weighed down by the stresses and the pressure of life and weighed down by discouragement, I pray, show your deliverance to them. Touch their heart, Lord. I give them every one to you, Lord. I place them in your hands and bless the ministry team as they minister today, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the leadership. I thank you for, for me and Femi, Lord. Bless them and encourage them and strengthen them, Lord. In Jesus' name, I bless everyone this, under the sound of my voice today. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Bless you.